Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done over 400 of them by now, so if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. Um, this program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers, so if you appreciate it and feel like supporting it in any amount, uh, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site. My guest today is Jeannie Zandi, and I'm really happy about that. I, I met Jeannie about five years ago at the Science and Non-Duality Conference in California, and I've wanted to interview her ever since then. Um, and she's been like, eh, yeah, one of these days when I get my website together, whatever. And, and that's kind of a good sign, actually, that people who are desperate to be interviewed, we tend to shy away from. Um, and I've had plenty of fish to fry, so I've been keeping busy. But finally now we're getting around to interviewing Jeannie Zandi. Um, Jeannie is the director of Living as Love, a nonprofit organization dedicated to seeding a culture of the heart on the planet, inspiring, teaching, and supporting people to live from their essence as love. A year before the birth of her daughter, Jeannie was plunged into a dark night of the soul that culminated in a radical shift of consciousness. She is known for her fearless clarity, tender mercy toward humanness, and a juicy, poetic, and often humorous style that draws from Advaita Vedanta, Sufism, Christian mysticism, and the ongoing revelation of fully engaged living. Re residing in Colorado, she travels widely in the U.S., bringing a down-to-earth embodied teaching of living as love. Wow. Yeah, who wrote that? <laughs> uh, so uh, I had the opportunity to read quite a few articles that you wrote this week, Janie, and listen to a number of other interviews and you had done and talks and all. And I just want to say that I, I think your, your writing is very beautiful and deep and your speaking is very eloquent. And uh, I think people are really going to enjoy this interview. Oh, yay. <laughs> um, somebody, I'll start right away with a question that somebody sent in. This is Julie from um, Olympia, Washington. Uh, oh, hi, Julie. You know Julie? Yeah. <laughs> I think so. She asked, um, you know, many teachers seem to be focused on awakening, quiet mind, realizing one's true nature, etc. These subjects do not seem to be of direct interest to Jeannie. Jeannie's interest seems to be solely on serving the holy, and this tends to manifest as serving love. She is deeply inclusive and loving of all aspects of being human. Do you agree with that assessment? Um, mm, can you ask it a different way? Because that would be a binary, and I'm finding my answer isn't a binary. <laughs> In other words, it's too either or, the way it was phrased? Uh, yeah. It's to either or. Okay, I can ask you so, a different way, oh, unless you he, want to go with it. Yeah, yeah. He, here it comes. Okay. <laughs> the way my mind works is a little bit like a, a collecting funnel rather than a, uh, you know, so. Right, you're analog, sort of, you're not digital. Okay. I just open and, you know, so I, I would say that, that what happens here is um, of a different languaging and a different... Um, uh, potentially orientation, or mm -hmm. at least the languaging is different. So there seems to be here a deep interest in uh, the the vibrating, alive, clueless moment. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes when we think of awakening, we think of um, something somewhere different or some other different kind of perception or you know something a little bit different and when i when i i tend to draw people uh through language and through um presence uh, into a kind of a direct experience outside of the mind of the vibrating simple moment mm -hmm. encouraging them to drop out of the mind's overlay the will's attempt to um, master the moment or to use the moment to get to a better moment. Uh, my emphasis is actually, and I don't use a lot of the language that people are used to um, hearing, awakening and things like this. Uh, for me, the realization of what we are and what we aren't is incredibly childlike. It's incredibly simple. It's incredibly uh, no-brainer. <laughs> 
innocent. And yes, and talking about it, um, I'm more of the style of talking from it. Mm -hmm. And what I find, uh, and this is something, this is something that's a little hard to um, put into words, but when I'm sitting with people, uh, there is a deep uh, drawing of, uh, or an inviting of attention um, below the mind uh, to this kind of wedding of presence and sensation that we are. Uh, this is my pointer. It's not a pointer down the road to some uh, eventual awakening if you do X, Y, and Z. It's actually a continual invitation out of the mind, down into the elementals, the elemental ground of being, of presence, and of the just this vibrating field out of which all of what we think of as the world is springs and, and forms. And so, uh, that orientation then what happens as as uh, we're invited there is that our arguments with that rise uh, arguments of trust arguments of fear arguments of uh, how am i going to find my car later <laughs> um, arguments of all manner of how do i say uh, the the creatures, the creature of the body's arguments with the fact that we can be here wide open. It's not very difficult for most beings to have a direct experience of being here outside the mind. It happens all the time. But the ways that are that, that the survival based creaturey aspect of us is much more concerned with something down the road um, hauls us out of there again and again. And so I would say that I have a deep interest, um, and it's not like a, a mental interest. It's not an interest apart from my being. It's difficult to speak without objects. There is uh, a living flame of a passion for uh, the alive moment and the ways that uh, we can be here as, as that, in that, together. And so a lot of what I do is I invoke that and then the arguments come. The arguments come in the form of questions, in the form of, uh, and then I drill down to the essence of the argument and hold someone there. Hmm. I think that what you just said is perfectly congruent with the idea of awakening, quiet mind, realizing one's true nature and so on. But perhaps what Julie was alluding to is that sometimes the emphasis on those things is made to the exclusion of humanness you know and and the the world is dismissed as illusory and emotions and relationships and all that stuff are are you know dismissed as sort of trivial distractions or whatever and yeah. uh, and you know and and that frankly that that got a little old for a lot of people in the whole satsang scene and the whole spiritual scene over the last decade i think it, there was more emphasis on that a decade ago than there is now and and now a lot more people are, are talking about embodiment and you know well yeah this is this is part of the reason you know when i was um how old was I? When I was in my 30s and I had just met my daughter's dad, he was very into Gangaji. Mm -hmm. um, and I went to see Gangaji and there was, you know, the, the big scene that used to happen around Gangaji. I don't know how it is anymore. Um, and I, I resonated with the things that she spoke, but I, I wasn't attracted. And maybe part of it was um, that at that time there was an interpretation and I was very close to this person who was my daughter's dad, right? And uh, there was this emphasis on, um, you know, uh, how do I say? It, it felt like there was a splitting off from, it was as though non-duality was being purchased by a splitting off from an aspect of the whole. Yeah. At least that's how it landed here. And I, I could never get on that. It never resonated with me in that way. And so I wasn't attracted. I, I liked Gangaji. I, I resonated with the truth that was there, but I wasn't called uh, to go back until I was, um, you know, deeply on my knees in a dark night. And, uh, you know, we can talk about that later. But mm -hmm. 
And if you think about what you just said, it's rather ironic that, um, that there should be any splitting off from the whole in the name of non-duality. Because non-duality is non-duality, and if there's splitting taking place, we're creating an, a, a, a duality. Yes, and I'm not saying that necessarily Gangaji was doing that, right. but I think that that was the that was and continues to be the old school uh, interpretation uh, that that we just go to this other place and this other perspective, and all this is just eh, and it and and what happens I I feel is that. In the name of we're not the body, which is absolutely one wing of the bird. <laughs> in the name of we're not the body, uh, we can actually be carrying on unconsciously the primary split between the unmanifest and the manifest and be speaking non-duality out our mouths as we're embodying a split. Mm -hmm. And I think that for some people at least, or maybe for everybody, that that can be a stage, a legitimate stage, um, that sort of split condition, which can be misinterpreted as final, but which is really very sort of intermediary. And, and ultimately, the heart doesn't like duality or division. And, you know, and if we're really, and if the evolutionary force that continues to guide us has its say, then a, a larger wholeness has eventually got to be realized. Seems, seems so. Yeah. <laughs> so besides Gangaji, um, what were some of your other early influences? Are you one of these people who like had spiritual yearnings in childhood or something, or did it kind of dawn later in life? So I wouldn't call Gangaji a big influence because I think I went once. Okay. <laughs> but um, I would say so. Uh, I've been. I would say spiritually oriented my entire life at some level, uh, varied levels at varied times. And as a child, um, I had a Catholic mom, and what I thought of was an atheist dad. I've learned now he's agnostic. Mm -hmm. So I would go to church. My mother is the kind of uh, person who uh, sees a sunset and feels like God speaking to her. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, God's present to her in that moment, right? Very devotional and, and innocent. And uh, then my father is a scientist, an agnostic. His parents were atheists. His, his father used to make nice religious women cry with his rational arguments <laughs> against religion. Mm -hmm. um, and so I grew up coming home from church, running to the garden and saying, Daddy, Daddy, God made the corn grow. And my father saying, uh, I made the goddamn corn grow. I'm out here hoeing, the, right? And my father's a very deeply, he's very into the natural world and, and has a beautiful devotional uh, quality to him toward life. So I grew up with this sort of interesting, uh, these two aspects of the innocent devotional and the rational skeptic. Mm -hmm. In fact, my father even sent me a membership to the Skeptic Society as mm -hmm. a present once. So in that milieu, I grew up half devotional, half questioning, and went through, uh, you know, I'm a Catholic, I'm an atheist, I'm a, I'm a this, I'm a that, but always, what's real? A, what's real? B, how, what is the essence of humanness? What, it, what am I? What's true? What's real? How do I be here in a virtuous, true, simple, uh, unencumbered way. How do I be a representative of what's true rather than a representative of, of limitation or fear or, you know, whatever. So that was my bent. Um, and I would say that I, I was never a seeker in the way that people are seekers in satsang and such. Um, I, I didn't even think about something called enlightenment. I thought that was something obscure that Chinese, old Chinese men were interested in. I, I just, you know, wasn't part of what captured my attention. What captured my attention was much more um, a, a Christ-like, Sufi-like, full embodiment of uh, of of divinity of of um, and you know I didn't know anything about the Eastern stuff and when I would come across it I could see that it was beautiful but it wasn't something that was sort of crossing my plate mm -hmm. um, and so 
um, I have a, a deep orientation to, um, how do I say, one of the things I learned early uh, in just out of college was how pain seems to be at the bottom of, uh, how do I call it, suboptimal behavior, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, behaving as a, a ferret instead of an angel, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, and so I had a penchant for finding the aspects of myself that felt funky, reactive, limited, fearful, and drilling down into the emotional knot at the bottom of those and freeing those up. Hmm. And one of the things that I discovered in there was that, and this wasn't through any uh, brilliance, being denied certain things in the relationship. We want someone to love us and we don't get exactly what we want in the relationship. And so there, there um, rises this longing. So what I would do is I would assume that there wasn't anything wrong with reality, but what was, I would fall back into the longing. I would take the longing or the angst or whatever the pain and, and drill down into it. Hmm. I treated life, for example, when I was a waitress, I treated, it was, um, how do I wait on this human being, no matter what they're like to me, no matter what a jerk they are, <laughs> whatever they're behaving like, how do I, serve them from a kind of, I just had this interest for, from young, who knows where it came from, where my, my, my idea for change was more based on the transformation of this than the changing of that. And so there was a lot of meeting very deep things before I had any idea that this was something particularly spiritual. I was just wanting to, uh, I didn't even think of it necessarily even as God or holy. It was more, how do I be uh, this beauty that I know that I am, you know, when looking at these places where I'm not so beautiful. That mm. I, That's intolerable here in a certain way. It's neat that you function that way naturally, you know, because... Uh, most people externalize things and blame the the external environment for the way they feel or you know this and that and you ha seems like you had a natural tendency to look within to find the, the source of it. I think it was the Dalai Lama or somebody said it's it's a lot easier to wear shoes than to pave the earth with leather. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. Exactly. Exactly. I can't say that I was a perfect saint in this or that I never blamed anyone because that wouldn't be true. Right. Um, but there was some and and I had the support of various things that I studied. I studied a lot of psychology. Um, I was involved in co-counseling. I was, you know, I, I, I read Jung, um, these kind of things. And I looked in my small New Hampshire town and um, for things that spoke to my spirit that resonated and uh, so um, you know I, I I did Sufi dancing and I you know did a variety of things um, was also very athletic and did a lot of dance and a lot of expressive things uh, reclaimed my capacity to sing uh, these kind of things and um, I would say I'm I would say that the the big influences at that time were just Various things that I would read that would that would sort of wake something up in me, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Do you have a degree in psychology or counseling or something like that? You know, I did end up going back to school to Naropa and getting a master's in transpersonal mm -hmm. counseling. Um, and all of that was a pretty kind of groovy eclectic sort of you know interest and resonance and come here and go there and taste this and at some point i said a very passionate prayer i was with a friend in a sweat lodge and in you know in sweat lodges there's this sort of bearing in the dark and the steam and there's this just bearing of the heart of the soul and i had seen this way that if i didn't get something that i want wanted and I burned through below that drop back into the longing let it burn that suddenly in that spot where there was a clutching there was just a freedom hmm. and so I prayed give me nothing that I want <laughs> slightly arrogantly very passionately 
you know, that way that we pray, you know, just decimate me, you know, that kind of thing, right? And um, and then this uh, dark night of the soul showed up shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. um, and boy, it was the direct answer to a prayer, but I didn't know that's what it was. And I, I didn't know what was going on. And mm -hmm. I would say that was my biggest influence and my biggest teacher, mm -hmm. uh, along with the simultaneity of being pregnant with my child. Mm -hmm. um, I was cast into a level of darkness that had no apparent cause. Mm. Uh, and the world, the, 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 the manifest world turned into cinders to me. Mm. Like all of the meaning I had invested in it faded. Um, I felt like a ghost. I felt like I was be being taken to another world. Uh, none, of my, none of my former ways of orienting to here uh, worked. And um, it lasted about four or five years. Uh, during that time, I was uh, pregnant and then a new mom. Um, my daughter's birth was probably uh, the darkest hour of this dark night. Mm -hmm. And yet such a sweetness to be joined by this amazing, wide open, you know, as I was being absolutely deconstructed, uh, she came in freshly open. And mm -hmm. so we were we were such great pals to each other because she had this very natural way as children do of questioning conditioning. Mm -hmm. um, and so she was like a, a little spiritual teacher, just questioning assumptions and, que you know, um, that was very beautiful. And during that time, I was quite desperate. I had no idea what was happening. And I, you know, just, yeah. And and that's when I met a few other influences. They, I like to call them my cleanup crew. <laughs> Do you ever read Suzanne Siegel's book, Collision with the Infinite? I did a long time ago, and mm. I, I barely remember anything from it, unfortunately. Some but, similarity. Yeah. She, she was pregnant, and um, she underwent this sudden shift, which for her was resulted in abject terror that went on for about 10 years. Uh, and the terror was largely because she couldn't find any sense of a personal self anymore. And she didn't know what had happened to her, even though she had actually been a meditation teacher before that. And um, she finally met Jean Klein, and he kind of cleared things up for her. And <laughs> <laughs> but um, so it reminds me of your story in a way. But um, that's interesting. I, that's I think I don't know when I read that. Yeah. Um, but it, it almost makes me want to go back and look. There was plenty of terror. Yeah. Plenty of terror. It was um, there was a there was a sort of a constant terror in the body. Um, but then there were also these little spiky terrors. Mm -hmm. When I have certain certain thoughts, anything about the future, spiky terror. Um, and then there was also the mind's secondary level of fear making, which mm -hmm. I recognized pretty early on was n <laughs> a detriment. <laughs> and I spent a lot of time uh, dropping out of the mind when it would come dropping out of the mind dropping into the ground breath the rippling creak mm. um, just really until until it uh, until there was a, a little fa a final face off with the mind which was very um, interesting it was it, it, it's comical now at the time it, w it was something that just was happening inside of me where you know most of us as you know uh, our mind, her everyday mind, her sense of me, totally laminated onto our uh, presence so that we actually think that's us, right? Mm -hmm. It's like laminated. And there was this moment <laughs> where uh, whatever I was looked at whatever the everyday mind was. It was almost like a cartoon, like you could picture like the Tasmanian devil over here just freaking out like <laughs> like this. and whatever I was looks at that thing and there rose this sort of wow like goodbye like like you you oh you are not my friend you know up until then this was the go-to right we go to our minds to solve things to figure things out this is us this is what we love and I saw it for what it was and I saw it as the source of suffering and it wasn't like I let it go. It was this sort of organic thing that just sort of happened. And and this thing screamed. And what it screamed was so interesting. And I think a lot of people who are confronted by the unknown, who cannot help 
but be confronted by the unknown mm -hmm. with something larger than they know how to handle like illness or losing your mind in my case um silence just ate my head just a second to see how it comes back um it screamed it screamed something like you will be alone you will be mentally ill you will be sick you will be dead it screamed all of these things at me as like the final sort of but it had no power mm. at that point all of the power all of my life's blood my attention that i had invested in this coping mechanism in building this me and in, in in you know trying to create the best me the most whatever me um all of that lifeblood that that life energy had slowly leaked away from an allegiance to it and that final moment when it screamed it screamed like i say like a tiny little ant on a raft in the middle of an ocean rather than as my overlord it was like oh right like you you you've been deposed <laughs> you've been deposed by this whatever whatever this is i didn't think about what is this <laughs> You know, uh, I wasn't thinking it was just a being, mm. a being it and something that was no longer necessary, sort of fading. I've been thinking about the dark night business all week because you write about it a lot and talk about it. Yeah. I, ha I have a lot of questions and points I want to discuss with you. But, but before we get into those, um, you mentioned you had a cleanup crew of various people you interacted with, I guess, um, after this thing came on. Who, who were some of your primary clean up well this this was the um the fortunate thing was mm -hmm. that so i was with my daughter's dad and he was very into satsang mm -hmm. and we were in taos new mexico his primary teacher was gangaji and uh he was just a very interested in and i think he oh he started to work on actually he was working on um an anthology of um Ramana quotes and quotes from people who sort of attributed themselves to Ramana in some way, their teaching. And so he was both organizing satsang, inviting all these teachers to Taos, where we lived, as well as collecting things for his book and sort of seeing who did he feel was authentic and that kind of thing. And so I was not interested because, uh, A, um, I'd already been down that route and in our relationship there was a lot of this sort of well it's not in your body can you just focus to this other place and you know this whole we had this whole kind of um, you know meeting of two different orientations mm -hmm. so I just thought satsang was this thing um, so then here comes Pamela Wilson mm -hmm. uh, to Taos and uh, I think um, Cass couldn't find a meeting spot um, so he had the meeting in our house, and I, I think my child was maybe a year and a half old at the time or something, and uh, Pamela was very welcoming of Sophia being in the room. So I, she was in my living room, so I went downstairs, <laughs> and a couple things happened. Uh, one was that the energy of satsang uh, soothed the terror in so that I was walking around with all the time is soothed it and uh, as well there was something that I was actually making a study of which was how do I not reference off this mind which is obviously the source of suffering and so I discovered in sitting in the satsang the support for dropping out of the mind and then the other beautiful thing was that Pamela looked at me and I don't even think I had said anything or maybe I had and she just started talking about the dark night and an experience that she had had and it was the first time besides a shred here or a shred there in the literature I hadn't found St. John of the Cross yet because I didn't know I had no you know I thought I was mentally ill I mean I had no idea what this was um, it was the first time that I felt my experience reflected and if you could imagine having looked for two and a half years in desperate terror for what the hell is going on, having consulted, is this postpartum depression? Is this like, what is this? Mm -hmm. uh, suddenly I felt uh, my, my experience reflected and some of the things that she said, I started to feel uh, at home. And so she, she came to Taos quite a lot back then. And so she was a, a, a deep 
a deep buddy of the heart, you know, just really, really got what I was going through. And, um, you know, I would sit with her privately and I would sit in her satsangs and it was the most, it was, you know, similar to, I went to a, a Zen session at Natalie Goldberg's house during this time. I was very pregnant. This was before Sophia was born, but I had a friend who was very into um, Buddhism. And so I went, I was just had nothing better to do at the time, you know, and I sat down with my pregnant belly and I just sunk into this awesome silence. And I attributed it to the fact that I had given myself permission for those few days to not have my attention on my life. And so satsang became this beautiful excuse with a beginning and an end to not have to solve this problem of what the hell was happening because my whole life had fallen apart. I, I had no idea which end was up. The only thing that made any sense to me was that the, 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 the sort of spiritual practice of being a mother of a baby, you know, and, uh, and so this, this way of this invitation to simply be, um, it was easy for me to simply be mm -hmm. when I gave myself permission to simply be and took my attention off of solving my life, you know. And so um, Pamela was a, a wonderful support in there. And then there was still, for me, um, something unmet. And I didn't know that that was true until I met Adya. And Adya was a big influence for me. I think I met him in around 2002. And I, I remember uh, Nirmala was a friend um, and Nirmala was... Um, someone who was sort of helping me bridge the sort of argument between the two sides, you know, the 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 body, the psyche, and then this non-dual thing, you know, like Nirmala was very good at, you know, I said, can I just email you? You know, we went back and forth sort of, I'd ask him questions. And um, so he gave us a, a, a recording of Adya. And then uh, we went to visit... Um, my daughter's grandmother and Adya was in Tucson and I got to see him for a day. And when, as the minute I saw him, I felt like uh, if, if each spiritual teacher may meet this or this, or maybe this, this, and this, when I met Adya, I felt boom, 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 you know, just like grounded, rooted, irreverent on the ground, awakening, but mercy and just such a I, it, it, he he was he made so much sense for me, and um, was a was a guide for me um, in some very impactful ways that had a lot to do with actually embodying what was happening, you know, uh, bringing the body along. So um, those were my. I had a lot of other influences, personal supports, um, and uh, but I guess those were the the two big. Okay. sort of spiritual teachery people that, you know, I went to a lot of their meetings. Yeah. It's funny. I mean, I'm in a sort of unique position because I talk to all these people and have become friends with them. But I, so maybe my perspective is a little different than the average listener. But I, I, I sort of feel nonetheless that we're kind of like this big family, you know, all, yeah. all interconnected and intertwined in various ways and, and you know, helping one another um, in a, there's a word for that. I forget the. There's a great, great word for that. Maybe symbiotic, but I don't know. Oh, interdependent. Interdependent and intersupportive, I would say, because dependent has sort of a negative connotation. But but there's a sort of um, cross fertilization. Maybe is a good word. Yes. You know yes. That, that takes place these days. And you know, Thich Nhat Hanh said the next Buddha may be the Sangha, and um, this it seems to me that that this is an a, an explanation of how that is so. Uh, it doesn't just mean one particular sangha that you go and sit in, but there's this sort of network around the world of, yes. of people that are uh, cross-fertilizing and, and enriching one another. Um, and it's really cool. Very. Yeah. I think, was it Ram Das who said, we're just all walking each other home? Yeah, that's nice. Love that. Yeah, yeah. So um, let's talk more about the dark night of the soul. I, as I read your stuff and listened, I, I kind of had a... Th Theory, and I don't know if this really gets to the heart of it, but I'm sure you, <laughs> you can help me. Um, 
Well, no. what's what's very um, cool is that I just got done reading a survey of practically everything that's been written mm -hmm. about the Dark Knight of the Soul that I could find probably about 15 books or so in yeah. the last six months. So I'm freshly, I'm freshly primed only because I'm about to write my own. So great. Well, you are the go-to girl when it comes to that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have search strings in my website. Things like, uh, I'm in hell. Help. Uh -huh. <laughs> what the frick is going on? These are my search strings on my website. <laughs> so my first question about that is, um, do you feel like a dark night of some degree, and we can talk about degrees, is a, a kind of an obligatory rite of passage for everyone on a spiritual path? Well, if I were to answer that question with anything, if I were to answer that question with either a yes or a no, it would be rather arrogant, I think. Mm -hmm. so. I'm just going to say, however it is, however it is, that the deeply ingrained with its tentacles in the very embodiment of the creature, however the energy management structure of coping and conditioning that has its sort of outpicturing in this concept of me, However, that thing is brought to its knees or deeply seen through, and I don't mean in a moment seen through, but I mean has the backbone of its will broken. However, that happens so that we are um, the, the sort of, how do I say, that is utterly humbled and the sense of what we are is... However, that happens, um, yay. <laughs> and I can't even begin to pretend to be an expert on pretty much anything um, but my own direct experience. Mm -hmm. um, and but if you've read I, 14 books about it, you've been exposed to other <laughs> perspectives about the whole thing and maybe some universal trends and, you know, have become it, apparent. I, I don't, none of them claim that this is the only way. Right. And, and, and neither would I. Um, but what happens, you know, there's there's something about a dark night of the soul. And I don't mean just a hard time because some of the books out there on the dark night of the soul use that phrase. And many of us use that phrase to describe a particularly gnarly human crisis that we went through and we deepened. Mm -hmm. That's not the dark night of the soul, although it has some similarities. The dark night of the soul you don't go through something and then you're just like kind of more deepened. <laughs> you go through the thing and you don't come out the other side. Mm -hmm. um, and St. John of the Cross is the, I mean, I bow to that guy for having written as much as he did to leave that beautiful legacy because he's so clear and um, it's so useful. And when I found uh, it just so happened, Mirabai Star was in a, sacred poetry class with me in Taos. Um, so we were classmates and she was working on her new translation of St. John of the Cross. So I got an early copy of it. I, I begged her, I said, I'll copy edit it, whatever. She had her staff already, um, but you know, I, I maybe contributed a typo or two or something, you know, but I got to read that. And as St. John says, when you're going through the dark night of the soul, you never think you are mm. because you feel way too wretched to be deserving of something so holy. Mm. And that was true for me too. It, mm -hmm. Even though my experience was utterly mirrored there, um, I didn't, I just kept assuming, you know, my life was over. I, I don't know, I'd screwed up somewhere. I, I don't know what, but so, um, what, what the dark night of the soul does is it's like a rotor rooter. And it, it actually go, you are forced into, it's almost like being forced into a small dark room with the worst things that live in your psyche. And as far as I can tell, the root of separation is a, an energy of deep, deep banishment. Something here should not be. Something here should be cast to hell. Something that's here should be gone. And facing off with that and facing off with all of the confusions in a very direct and felt way allows the instrument to be open in a way that it can actually perceive those holdings 
in other beings. So it's sort of like when you get rolfed, you can walk around the world and you see all the people that need to be rolfed, you know what I mean? Or that kind of thing. It's like, um, and so this body can detect in a way, um, I, I'm going like this and it, it, you know, I don't know what that is. You know, could it be the chakras? Could, I don't know. I, I'm not big on kind of <laughs> cataloging things, let's say. Um, but there's a sense as I move through giving satsang in different places, um, people who were masquerading as awake, people who were maybe had an experience um, seeing teachers and feeling the opennesses and then the 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 places that were still where separation still lived. So um, I think the darkness of the soul is a great sort of rotor rooter for embodiment because it, it forces your nose deeply into the places where conflict lives. Mm. Um, but I also, um, you know, the what St. John says is that the dark night of the soul is an influx of light, God's light that sends the impurities up into our faces. Um, and while we're assuming that this, all, this is, you know, God's a, a jerk because we're experiencing this, it's actually this, we're experiencing our own dross rather than God as all this stuff comes to the surface. Um, where was I going with that? So, so I can, you know, I have, I have a sense that the holy has many methods, <laughs> so to speak, and there are many ways that that this uh, confusion drops away. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that there's also some uh, some disservice being done uh, where people are somehow, or some confusion happening where people have had an experience. And we have all been sold this sort of uh, candy machine enlightenment where you put your quarter in and you have the right insight and then you become Ramana. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, you know, as I walk around, there's a lot of people either feel really bad like they failed mm -hmm. because all they can see is this darkness beckoning and they've tried all the up and out sorts of methods. So either a lot of people feeling really like they've failed or a lot of people posing. And um, yeah, so there's something, there's something, <laughs> you know, I do this, always being, always becoming, you know, mm -hmm. the, the eternal uh, spaciousness that we are, the emptiness that we are, and then, oh, I just bumped my head on the door, you know, the Zen stick, mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the beauty the beauty of the capacity of the human being uh, in getting on its knees in, fr in front of this emptiness, as this emptiness, um, becoming a servant to its perfection in a way that like, and this is like, it's so beautiful when a being doesn't just stop, but, but um, and I, I feel like the, the force of awakening uh, does this of its own accord. It, it moves into the dark corners and says, how about this bub? You know, you're sitting on the cushion over there, but what's this? And of course, we are aided in that process by all the beings around us, because what's unconscious is unconscious, and how can we see it? But when eight people point to something funny in you, you know, that's the, I think, the integrity that Adya talks about. Great. Well said. Um, I have a few thoughts based on what you've said, and uh, then you, I'll bounce it back to you. Um, the thing you just said about people um, either feeling they failed or posing. Um, before I started doing this show, I wasn't really hobnobbing with the larger spiritual community out there, you know. But when I started doing it, I, what hit me almost off the, off the bat was that there are a lot of people who are mistaking an intellectual understanding for actual realization. You read enough Ramana books and, not, and Advaita books and stuff, and you can really get sort of intoxicated with the understanding and fail to distinguish between that and what someone like Ramana was actually experiencing. And I would say to well, such, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, and then you become basically a tool of sacrilege because these beautiful, alive truths become dead spiritual concepts that yeah. then you, you then perpetrate on other people. Right. 
quite obnoxiously in many cases on chat groups, I would add. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, I had an actual guy, no disrespect to him if he's watching, but I had one guy actually say to me, there isn't an inch of daylight between me and Ramana. And what he was saying was, I get what Ramana was saying, therefore I'm in the same state Ramana was. Um, and, you know, I, would, I think I said to that person, well, yeah, if, if you could actually step into his sandals and see the world through his eyes, I think you'd be in for a surprise, you know? Well, and, e and why are we even having these conversations, except that wh why do we even need to have a spiritual resume? What, what is the need what is the need what is the need to put ourselves on a spiritual map yeah and and then to your second point about the um, people who feel they failed I think that what's really helpful for them is uh, an understanding that we're kind of alluding to here which is that there is a vast spectrum of possibility possible range of development and deepening and clarification and purification and, and all that stuff. And if you think of it in simplistic black and white terms, like you're, you're not awake or you are awake, you know, people don't know, where, they can't place themselves on that map because it, that map is unreal. It's really a vast spectrum. And um, I don't know, go ahead and, say, and respond to that. Well, I, I was just noticing how anytime we have an either or going on, it's, the, it's separation. Yeah. At any time things turn into black and white, I'm this or I'm that, or, or, you know, and you can see it, you can see it in relationship, you can see it in how people, our whole psyches are programmed to do this black and white thing that basically then self-abuses anything that doesn't fit into the good half. Um, and 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 it, it completely factors out uh, the organic nature of being a human being and the fact, see, in our culture, which is very, um, there's a, an imbalance toward, I would say, sort of uh, um, unhealthy yang. We worship the, we worship, worship Athena, who sprang from Zeus's head fully armed, armored and ready to fight, right? We, we worship Superman. We worship if there's a seed in the ground, a sprout, uh, a, a plant, a flower, a fruit, and a rotting. We worship the fruit, and if something looks promising, a flower is pretty good, but the rotting and the seed, forget about it. Mm. And so when someone is in a beautiful deconstruction experience, and everyone's yelling at them, could you just manifest? A, you know, this is clearly your, your fault. You're not manifesting a good life, or, or um, can you just come up and out? Well, there's actually a, a valid spiritual passage that's actually down and in, mm. but we're terrified of that because this is a land that we don't know, a land that's been absolutely painted with a red X. You're supposed to be functioning. You're supposed to be bright and look good, and anything less, you're probably screwing up, and that's if you said that to a seed or a shoot, if you shouted at a seed that was attempting to lie in the dark and gestate, and you shouted at it that it was doing the wrong way, could it just get get it up to look like a fruit? Well, that, it, it's almost like shouting at a caterpillar to not build its cocoon to liquefy and sprout wings. Mm -hmm. it, it's a complete uh, ignorance of um, what seems to be a way yeah. All right. What I take from what you just said is, uh, among other things, is just that um, there's a value in understanding the actual mechanics of awakening, and um, it's and in doing so, one can save oneself a lot of grief by um, being. You know, well, firstly by sort of going off on on tangents that aren't going to be fruitful because they're really not getting down and in, as you say, but also in terms of um, misunderstanding wh wh where one actually is on, on the path. And, and um, it's like, I'm not phrasing, it's not coming up. Go ahead. You, uh, Can I yeah. say something? Yeah, please. So uh, here, here, mm -hmm. uh, in each moment, like we can just, we, you know, we can talk and have a lot of fun with a lot of 
ideas and a lot of movements and a lot of theories and a lot of sort of understandings, you know, sort of like up in the fighter jet looking down at the territory, right? Mm -hmm. But here, uh, always, um, those have to be bathed in a humble returning to this vibrating present outside of any ideas we have. Um, and there's a way that, how do I say, there's a top down way of looking at development. I got an idea and now I'm going to go there. I'm getting, you know, and there's great insights that can really help us identify when we're swimming around in an eddy. At the same time, in every moment, for every human being, right now, below all of our thoughts about all of it, there is something beautiful going on. Sometimes that beauty hurts. Sometimes uh, we fight that hurt. But below all of our ideas, uh, there's an organic, uh, alive dance of presence and sensation that we leave attempting to master it with the mind and the will. And no amount of overview is going to substitute for a dropping in in a humble, open, no idea kind of way to actually sit in and as the simplicity that we are and watch what it's doing, where it wants to go. And in my work, this is what I do is I bring people into this vibrating power. I mean, Eckhart called it the power of now, which was just a great phrase that where, where's God? Nowhere but here. Where's life? Nowhere but here. Where is anything? Nowhere but here. And here, below the mind, it's incredibly simple. Mm -hmm. There's presence, there's sensation, and then there's how do I, in this moment, uh, in a way, do my best to be true, um, do my best to... Uh, sort of like not act from delusion. And uh, there's there's a lot to learn about how delusion moves in a moment. Um, but to me, it's like, um, there's it's, it's really fun to talk at the fighter jet level. And then we have to, I have to, <laughs> I have to be almost like baptized in nowhere and just drop into like hi, like hi, which is my main pointer, by the way. My hi, main pointer hi. is hi. <laughs> 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 and it will stop someone cold in their attempting to master their awakening, mm. drawing them here. And for a moment, there's a moment of, you know, huh? A question came in from Kristen in Chicago apropos to what we were just saying she asks um how do you know whether someone is posing as being spiritually awake or in, or enlightened or whether they are actually awake uh how do i know or how does anyone know um both i mean you were saying a bit we, we were both commenting on that a, f a few minutes ago and so kristen wanted to know you know how, okay. how can we judge or determine that yeah I, i'm my answer is I don't know. <laughs> um, here, you know, Bernadette Roberts said a really cool thing. She said, so much became clear after it dropped away. Mm -hmm. So when we're embroiled in things, w things aren't clear. And then when things drop away, we look back and we can see what was happening. We couldn't see it before. But by virtue of its absence, we see all these kinds of things. And so, um, in here, uh, this is an instrument of resonance. And so there are almost like energetic signatures of what I would call a lie, deadness. It's, it's actually a dead quality. There's a, there's a dead quality to concept and there's a dead quality to um, sort of like these kind of gnarled up conflicted globs of life energy that we're attempting to repress. There, mm -hmm. There's actually an energetic broadcast mm. 
um, that that bodies put out. And um, sometimes somebody can have a lot of Shakti and it can just bl blow you away and your instrument just gets blown out and you're not, you're not intuiting anything, you're not picking up anything. But in the average human being, uh, and, and many of us have this capacity when we start to listen to our instinctual intuitive knowing rather than our head knowing, we can feel when there's an energy of yuck, like uh, there's an energy of openness that's like a meal, it's like a full meal. When you meet someone like that, you know, I remember the first time I, I met David White at a, it, this was, you know, long ago in like my Naropa days and there was a conference and there was an author I won't name whose books I'd read who I'd really loved his books and I went to see him and his energy was you know he talked he was in his head a lot and he talked a lot and I I couldn't really listen and then I went I left there and I went into a presentation by David White who I didn't know and when he walked into the room the way he opened the door and the way he stepped into the room and the way he looked around had more of a transmission of all the things that other guy had lots of ideas about and he hadn't even spoken a word. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, a quality of yum <laughs> in a being that's open and flowing and um, a quality of something else. And, and I would just say um, to Kristen, to follow your resonance, despite what your head or other people say, follow this sense of there's food here. I don't know why, because each of us, we're, we're all so unique in what our particular um, system, what will be transformative to us. Mm. <clears throat> so a minute ago, you used the phrase instrument of resonance with reference to your own nervous system and um, I like that a lot and it, it it brings us back to the dark night of the soul thing because I have a feeling that everybody has the potential everyone is an instrument of resonance but you know a lot of those instruments aren't very well tuned you know um, and there's you've used various words like yuck and guck and whatnot in this interview. Uh, you know so using those kind of words we, we you know you know we all kind of come in with a certain amount of guck uh, clogging up our instrument and uh, it seems to me that a dark night of the soul and correct me if you see it differently is a, a clearing away of that guck and the intensity of the whole dark night experience kind of depends on how much guck there is and how what our destiny is in terms of how quickly it's going to be cleared away well uh, the these this seems like your your theory is mathematically appealing. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like you know, I'm just imagining. I'm thinking about like my physics class in high school. You know, and the volume of the guck and the height and the width <laughs> and so much time. You know that sort of thing. But I think we have to allow for a deep bow to mystery. Oh yeah. Um, because. My sense is the dark night is not only the rising of scum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there is a way that there's a way that the faculties of mind and will, and, and Saint John talks about this. He uses the word obscure mm -hmm. in Spanish, whatever that is, are are obscured, are darkened. That the 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 mind can't work the way it used to. The will can't work the way it used to. The, and this is before the the flotsam and jetsam starts rising. There is something, it's almost like this little holy mechanic that runs in and takes your carburetor. You know, there's something about the darkness that's not only the rising stuff, but the, but the actual uh, gift of the darkening of the faculties that orient us to the to the earth, to the world, um, and that's what he—that's what he talks about. He talks about us being weaned of our uh, reliance on the things of this world to be um, prepared to be here, of not of here, but not of here. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure it's just a gut clean out with you know uh, 
if you did if you're in there for 10 years you know you really had a lot of shit and if you're in there for five minutes you were pretty rosy already i'm not sure that that covers the entire mystery of it although it is appealing i think it's part of it um you know jesus said you can't pour new wine into old wineskins absolutely so there needs to be a a restructuring of the instrument um in order for it to be a fit servant of of the divine if you will uh, yeah, I like I like your language. I'm yeah, right there with you. <laughs> and um, I suppose, and there's all these variables, you know. I mean, one is how much guck, and another is, you know, how are you, are you going to like kick and scream and resist, or are you going to sort of cooperate? Um, well, and this is part of what Saint John says, yeah. and um, this is part of what's extremely difficult, and part of what uh, is useful um, having the experience reflected is that. Uh, for most people, when they enter the dark night of the soul, even if they've got a spiritual uh, orientation, it is so upending that it is, uh, you know, St. John counsels, you know, be quiet, just be quiet. It's like, well, good luck, you know. Uh, and as I, you know, I meet with people who are going through this, we've had several uh, online series, um, and they come to my events and, um, Silence just state my head again. <laughs> Gulp. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I'll say something and then as soon as okay. you as soon as you, you get can. your train of thought, interrupt me. We'll um, see. But uh, I have a friend that I'm going to present you with a range of possibilities here. I, I have a friend whom I've interviewed three times, Harry Alto. Um, his dark night, if it was that, consisted of about 15 minutes uh, during which he, his customary unbounded st uh, awareness shrank down to individual nature uh, f from his earliest memories as a child he was always sort of unbounded and free and but he heard all these people talking about you know bliss and all unboundedness and he said what is that and he went for a walk and for and all of a sudden boom he was just an individual he said i can't live like this get me out of here you know and, <laughs> and about 15 minutes later it cleared and he was back to his usual way of functioning on the other extreme uh, you know, I've been in touch with a couple of people who are literally paralyzed, uh, bedridden, need help going to the bathroom by um, an extreme, apparently, kundalini awakening. There may be other factors, there might be something nutritional going on, whatever, but uh, they regard it as some sort of spiritual catharsis, but it's so extreme that it's totally incapacitating. And then we have all kinds of possibilities in between. Um, and and I would say let's turn that line uh -huh. into a three-dimensional mystery. Okay. Because your line, it's still in mathematically. Mm -hmm. There's you know the guy who spent 15 minutes, and then the woman, the woman, you know the people in bed, and then everything in between implies a line. It and does. what I would like to invite mm -hmm. is at least a three-dimensional, if not more. Uh, bow to the mystery of this so we can seek to understand because that's what we do but we have to keep throwing our models in the acid bath of humility yeah these are just theories everything for yeah. me is a working hypothesis nothing is is a done deal yeah, yeah. so where are you going i don't i don't mean to no, intentionally okay. derail you you're not derailing <laughs> me and uh, hopefully i'm not derailing you um we're just kind of going around a little bit on um you know what a dark night is, how uh, inevitable it is, uh, how uh, extreme it may be, what what can may, be may what I can be yeah what can be done if anything to ameliorate it those kind yeah. of points yeah okay um, boy those were a lot of questions I had an answer to one of them and then it <laughs> <laughs> you're slippery I have a very, you you're, know, you're like catching a fish and he slips right out of your hand yeah it's exactly <laughs> what it's like like the the basic you know, I like to say, if you put your ear up to my ear, you just hear the Sahara winds blowing through, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. And the thoughts, the, the thoughts are the... Well, I can reiterate those if it, if it helps you. No, no, I think silence is just good, just to hang here and um, contemplate the dark night. So, uh, there are lots of forms of darkness that can have lots of different causes. Um... And I think it's a dangerous penchant of the mind to do something like start to think, 
I have to have a dark night, you know. Mm. I have to have a dark night to wake up, you know. And, and when people come to me, they start to think that because I'm speaking from my experience. But I think it's very dangerous for us to orient in any kind of a way, or maybe not dangerous, but slightly delusional and inviting uh, the manifestation of things that might not be necessary. Yeah, and so they have people feeling bad because they haven't had a dark night. And, right. Well, you know, or, give me or a dark night have, pill. I or, want one. <laughs> or you have the person lying in bed who's going through the 10 year thing, feeling like they're the spiritual idiot. Mm. And so all of this is um, a penchant of the mind to reduce what's mysterious into catalogable catalogable things that we can do something about. And I would mm. say, yes, there's definitely a level at which it's important to do things about things. So if you have Lyme disease, it's important to diagnose the Lyme disease and see what part that plays in how your brain's working and how depression's working. And um, if you have some kind of, and all of these things have to be held so lightly, so lightly because it's mysterious the way that the powers of uh, of this whole operate. So if we get an idea, I have this illness, it's incurable, blah, blah, blah. We can, we can saddle ourselves with a heavy, unnecessary weight. At the same time, we ignore our illness and pop around like a little puer thinking that the universe is going to take care of everything. And then we fall over dead because we didn't like take care of the gangrene in our foot right yeah, yeah and between these two between these two it's like trust in god tie your camel there's a constant um almost to me invitation to the human being to keep as i said baptizing oneself in the unknown in humility in opening in i don't know help here i am open I'm shedding everything I've built up until this moment to sort of open myself to the latest bulletins from the beloved, you know, mm -hmm. in this empty unknown. So we have to, in a way, uh, constantly open ourselves at the same time as do our best to address the the levels of our existence from our, you know, anybody who's ever, I think even Adya said when he was in the hospital with his stomach pain you know wow the body like whoa mm -hmm. right like like we have these levels all of the levels require um kind of different tending and so if someone you know i see people that come to my work hoping they're having a dark night <laughs> because what else can explain this thing mm -hmm. you know and and then seeing that uh sometimes people have had a lot of abuse in their young lives and what they could really use is somebody to hold a space for them to move in there and do the grieving they need to do and whatever else. But then there are also these instant healings. And so each of us has to sort of take responsibility and do the detective work while keeping our relationship loose with that penchant to fix everything inside of a conceptual straitjacket that then defines the outcomes because we've suddenly become a slave to our perspectives. Yeah, no, I hear you, and that's it's. I appreciate that caveat that, you know, well, like you said, you know, trust in God but tie your camel. I think it's it's natural and perhaps even desirable to try to understand things. But at the same, but keep it balanced and realize that you're not going to totally nail anything down. There's always the element of mystery, as you said, that everything is always somewhat theoretical. You know, you're, you're trying to gain a better understanding of all kinds of things in the spiritual world. I mean, that's why there's so many books and scriptures. They, 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 <laughs> yeah, we, they enrich, we keep trying. <laughs> they enrich our understanding. But, yes. you know, but they're not going to, you're not going to provide, their, their intention is not to be, uh, exclu the exclusive, you know, tool for for spiritual development. Obviously, there has to be the experiential tool, and that's very mysterious and non-intellectual. Right, and 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 so, what I would say, and and this is part of what I'm what I'm writing about and what I teach about. What I would say to people who feel that they have a large helping of darkness. Now, it's it's really. Um, I, 
I want to say on this sweet earth, there's something that we don't always say, which is that there are some things that we can't solve. Mm -hmm. And I want to put that as our kind of our, our gravity or our ground. Um, that's not to make us necessarily hopeless, um, but it is to acknowledge that the human condition um, includes lots of things um, that uh, we apparently get to be with without a solution. Um, that said, um, we are very motivated when we're suffering to find the solution to that suffering. And it's important to cover all of the bases, um, the, the medical bases, the psychological bases um, that can be contributing to, to darkness. Um, and I would say it really matters in a way, like in the dark night, the greatest skill um, that I uncovered was uh, simply to abide uh, in the unknown moment and meet what's rising. Um, sometimes we need support in that. Um, yeah. And that the more we get involved with the crazy mind and our freak out about it, the more suffering there is. But someone who, for example, has Lyme disease doesn't want to just sit on their butt being necessarily. They, they might want to do plenty of that because it's very nice for the body, but they'll also want to address this other level. A Kundalini is a whole other area. And um, I'm not an expert in that, but I have had people in my work who have um, been tremendously challenged by Kundalini openings that happened on top of a sort of a ungrounded um, relationship of the creature of the body mm. to the ground and various psychological issues that just made them into a hot mess, basically. Yeah. Um, and and some some of those things need a variety of um, of attention, of skills, mm. of learning grounding, of addressing the psychic, the psychological stuff that's coming up, etc. It's complex. Sometimes. Yeah. It's been a long time since I've read about St. John of the Cross, but as I recall his story, he was locked in a closet for 14 years by the administrative types who didn't like his mystical t tendencies. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he had dysentery, he was fed bread and water, he spent a lot of time sitting in his own diarrhea. It was, it was not a real pleasant scene. He, um, was, he was beaten also. Beaten, yeah, it was, it was rough. And I guess that was all happening while his dark night was happening, that, that would be enough to give anyone well, a dark night, I would say. But. This is funny because he doesn't, in my reading of him, I have yet to actually read his account of his dark night. Hmm. Like his writing on the dark night is counseling um, other, you know, mm -hmm. nuns and monks, basically, mm -hmm. um, in trying to, what he wants to do is basically help these people not go down an eddy yeah. and get stuck somewhere and stay sort of in in the flow of the unfolding that's happening um so i'm not sure where and when his dark night happened and if his time in the jail cell was what what did it to him so to speak well the reason i brought that up is actually um aided by the point you just made which is i'm, I'm trying to get at the the notion that um there, there might, there might be things we can do, which would um, make, which would smooth the whole process of the dark night to make it not last as long, to make it not be as as <clears throat> horrible, uh, you know. And maybe that's what John, Saint John was trying to offer. And you've mentioned other things. I mean, there might be therapies. There might be herbal supplements. There, there could be all kinds of mm -hmm. things. I mean, for instance, this this Kundalini person I'm thinking of. You know, um, she probably has terrible endocrine problems and thyroid out of balance, and and a lot of times huge spiritual energies coursing through the body can really throw it out of whack, and there can be all sorts of methods to help, to, to just you know give it a, some assistance in the process it's going through, so it doesn't have to be as terrible. Hmm. Potentially. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would say. Um, in my experience with with what I experienced, uh -huh. uh, I would say that any uh, what the single most uh, comforting thing that I have experienced in holding space for people who are going through that mm. is to have their experience mirrored. 
um, because out in the world it's rare to find this spoken to, even in the books on Dark Night of the Soul. Explain um, mirrored. In other words, um, uh, what's happening there is what happened here. I see. So, so um, they can meet somebody they can relate to who there, also, a, I've been there, on, done that. On some kind of a map. Yeah. Some kind of a map other than the cultural map, which is you're screwing up. You're and crazy. you need and you need and you need to like get yourself together yeah you know and it's actually it's actually helpful to hear no you're actually supposed to fall apart mm -hmm. and and so what i find is a whole secondary level of suffering is actually the lack of having one's experience be um reflected put on a map the isolation of it, the yeah. aloneness of it, while you're surrounded basically by culture and family who don't know what's happening. So, exactly. yeah, so it makes that's it worse, huge. worse than it needs to be. Yeah, that's that's huge. Yeah. Um, and then another thing that's really really useful um, in my experience is to uh, restore a healthy relationship with the ways that the body purifies energy mm -hmm. crying shaking um also uh restoring a sense of the grounded quality of a body because early trauma pulls us up out of that energetic relationship with ground and so the energy just spins and pings inside the body especially mm -hmm. terror um yeah, and you mentioned you played a lot of aggressive soccer during that period. So physical uh, exercise could is be. very, very good because yeah. the energies are so huge, and the 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 more that anything sort of bores down into that uh, core fight, the more we behave like an animal. That's yeah. why relationship is so great for bringing up that kind of stuff. It's like uh, a kind of a um, we have no room to run, so we fight kind of thing. So as these things these things are being stripped off we get increasingly irritable and creature like and so um outlets for that are, besides just taking it out on the people around you are very useful yeah and if you just lie there in bed and marinate in it um chances are it's just really going to you know get more more and more severe whereas if you can balance stabilize integrate you know get go for a hike go for a swim you know things like that to, to whatever extent you're capable it seems to me would i mean even in conventional the conventional world they say that exercise produces endorphins and it you know helps to cure depression and all kinds of things so must help with this too yeah definitely yeah yeah here's a question from john in texas um he asks is it possible to be in a dark night period or experience and yet be aware that it's a natural part of one's spiritual evolution? In other words, not to just feel like, I don't know what the heck is happening to me, but realize, oh yeah, this is a dark night, I'm just going to grin and bear it, and uh, you know, something good is happening in the long run. Um, well, my experience is that the dark night actually lifts off the capacity to have the mind um, have a perspective toward things. So whether the mind will try to say this is a very bad thing, the mind will try to say this is a very good thing, um, but that capacity of the mind is actually in a dark night kind of, uh, the whole point of the dark night is to lift that capacity off of you of uh, conceptualizing reality versus being immersed in it. Um, I would imagine if someone had studied uh you know if you were a catholic and you had studied with saint john you know and you it was so in every fiber of your being that this darkness was coming uh that maybe there would be a, a something in you that would say oh this is just the dark night but my sense is um and this is it's this is difficult to actually put into words because the things we think are true and the things that the the things that live below our conscious awareness um as those rise uh there isn't a sense of knowing something there's much more a sense of things rising in a not knowing so you know all things are possible um it wouldn't it has not been my experience i have not met anyone um who has 
been in a, a true dark night who's just like, oh, groovy, yeah, it's just the dark <laughs> night. You know, it'll pass. It, you know, it's two. It'll be out of here by five. And, but people you know. come to your retreats, and presumably those people have an advantage when they're sitting with you talking about it and being listened to oh. and being mirrored over those who are just out in Peoria, Illinois, have no idea what's happening to them. Um, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Even for a moment to consider that the big thing is when we're alone inside of the conditioned perspective, it's I have to do something. I have to do something about this. I have to do something about this. And and St. John says, no, this is a this is a passive passage. You don't have to do anything about it. But to tell someone whose frightened creature is activated and the way the frightened creature works is I have to do something about this and this is how we're conditioned to even disable that for a sec for someone to rest um, and this is what happens when they when they meet me when they sit with me is that there's a sense of uh, the capacity to rest to rest in now that your life may be a complete mess you don't know what's happening where's the ground where's breath where's presence hello as I was reading your um, one of your articles, I wrote up a question. It took me a few minutes to write this question, to phrase it right, so maybe this will be useful. And, um, would you say that a dark night happens because we've begun to realize that outer sources of fulfillment are inadequate, but we are not yet grounded in inner fulfillment, and this realization correlates with a purging of everything which occludes inner fulfillment? Interesting. Read it again. I like it. Read yeah. it again. Would you say that a, it's like we've, well, just to, before I read it again, it's like you've let, you, the boat has cast off from the sh one, one bank of the river, but it hasn't reached the other bank yet. So you're kind of in limbo land. But let me read the question. Would you say that a dark night happens because we've begun to realize that outer, whether voluntarily or forcibly, I'd say, we've begun to realize that outer sources of fulfillment are inadequate? but we are not yet grounded in inner fulfillment. And this realization correlates with a purging of everything which occludes that inner fulfillment. Um, I would say again, um, and <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know where I'm going. Yeah, hey, I know where you're going. Just it's smiling a, at me. We'll just keep I can feel doing that seesaw. <laughs> yeah, undercurrent with you. And I wanna, I just wanna bow to the, to the inquisitive mind, and and I have one that mm -hmm. has that makes connections and discovers things and has insights. I remember reading something that the Sufi Ibn Arabi, who was called the Sheikh of Sheikhs, and he was a grandpa when Rumi was a toddler. And um, I read something that he wrote about crucifixion and about, I could feel a hundred corners of my experience and knowing sewing together because of something that he said. It was like click, 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 click. It was beautiful. And then that gave me uh, more of a capacity, more of a vehicle to speak to certain things. So. Um, all hail the amazing inquisitive mind and, and all hail all of the the sort of um, and I'm thinking about my daughter right now and something that that she wrote for school when she was talking about how she absolutely adores unknown and adores the human uh, penchant for building models that never quite encapsulate the unknown and how thrilling it is for her that there's always more unknown to discover which which implies more exploration and more models and then you know and each one of these is a is a tiny view into this massive reality that will never encapsulate with the mind and yet we keep trying yeah. so that's what science I, does I just, you know, science builds, builds models, tests them, revises them. Yes. It just keeps doing this, and it, it has its, you know, it's, it's not everything, but it's something. Great fun. It is. <laughs> and I want to say with all humility, um, this, this reality, uh, it's, we have to keep uh, invoking mystery in here. So, mm -hmm. What you're what you're suggesting about the dark night, um, maybe um, I feel like we would have to. And, you know, I, I've spent my life at different times wanting to sort of in my mind crafting another study 
uh, could we get a population of all people across the earth who've ever experienced a dark night mm -hmm. and find out were they just, you know, sitting on the couch, drinking beer, watching I Love Lucy, could give a crap about spiritual anything, you know what I mean? And then suddenly the dark night hits. I mean, why it comes, how it, how it comes, who it comes to, how long it lasts. Um, to me, your theory sounds pretty good. Certainly it could apply uh, to me in that I already had a good sense that um, fulfillment wasn't going to come from the outside. Uh, but I, I honestly don't know. Okay. Well, I would have been rather surprised and somewhat disappointed if you had said, yep, Rick, that's absolutely it. You nailed it. We've, we've totally figured it out now. You, know, so patent, you like this. Patent that. Like, <laughs> like this <problem. laughs> um, well, it's, it's, this is the way my mind works. And, uh, but it's, and I sometimes actually get criticized for it. But, you know, there's always this sort of little... Um, paradox thing that happens. I even have a T-shirt that says "Paradox" on it, where I I I I, I fly theories, you know, but then yeah. I, I'm not I'm not trying to sort of nail things down with any finality, you know. I, I right. just it's just like poking it in, from different well, directions. This is your fun. Yeah. Right. This is your fun. Right. <laughs> and here's another one for you. Um, <laughs> do you think? I, I, I don't know why I'm even asking this, because I know what you're going to say, but uh, do, do you think that a regular spiritual practice of some sort can kind of chip away at the darkness so that it's removed incrementally with, um, so that it doesn't have to be swallowed? It's like, you know, eating a, they have those hot dog eating contests where yeah. people eat 50-something hot dogs in, in, a, in a very short amount of time. All right, so there's that, and then there's you know, having a hot dog a day for a month or yeah, two. Yeah, um, no, I hear you. Yeah. I, I definitely understand that. And again, it's 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 another mathematical. It's we're going back to the mathematical one. You know, uh -huh. with the the quantity of dark and can we empty some out? Yeah, and can we? Can we? Uh, wanna, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I again want to invoke the three hundred and sixty degree mystery, mm -hmm. and and say that. So from the age of, so I had a, a decent childhood, you know, sort of a. Mm average American childhood, you know, no, no huge traumas. Um, and when I was 23, I found um, co-counseling and it was, I, I was beside myself with glee because I discovered that I could focus my attention on suboptimal aspects of myself, reactivity, grief, whatever. And I could actually move that pain um, out and experience freedom. I was like, wow, like bring it on down. Let me find everything in me that's that's a little funny mm -hmm. and, and drill down, right? So I did a ton of that. By the time the dark night hit, that was my way. I, th that had been probably about 13 years of teaching this, having lots of sessions, moving lots of stuff out. Not in any kind of, um, it was very clean. It was just like this clean burning thing that was like my hobby, you know what I mean? Um, and if I had a spiritual practice, it was crying. It was, I would give myself, you know, and I, I find a lot of company in the Sufis in this, you know? It's like this sort of dropping into the longing in the heart or the loss and just, it be became like a beautiful thing as though crying was this like, worshiping this opening of the heart you know it wasn't this grim dark thing it was like the same as laughing only with some moisture you know kind of catharsis thing. Of some sort. yeah this is how how it, it was for me and mm -hmm. and um you know crying from being touched you know whatever so then the dark night hits and i have to say for myself thank god i had this capacity to move energy because mm -hmm. there was more energy than i knew how to move now this energy was not like childhood this, childhood that. It was much deeper than that. It was much more unconscious than that. It was much more primordial than that. Like, uh, if, and so, I think part of the model that you're talking about uh, assumes a kind of a a holding tank of sort of dischargeable stuff, right? 
which which we do have and and i would say as i watch people whose dark night experience uncovers trauma um like i mean deep trauma ptsd type trauma or um people who haven't done any emotional work all they've done is spiritual work and they get their top popped off and then there's just so much chaos so much conflict so much coming up so i would say yeah it really does help to have some you know i think i just says something about like you're going to either but whatever you don't face before you're going to face it after so you know um so there is something something uh valid i think to what you say that that it is useful to have methods to move energy and to have faced some of these things but in the dark night there is a level of conditioning that is pre-verbal i don't know if it's pre-lifetime that is very dark very nonverbal very i can't see very terrified very creaturey that is as far as i can tell pretty hard to face unless you're forced there um because we will do the animal will do anything to get out of going into that room where it thinks it will be destroyed and we are deeply convinced that if we go into the room where we feel that bad and for most of us it's just unconscious we just don't even know it's living down there you know if we go into that room we're going to die mm -hmm. and so the the human psyche is absolutely amazing at crafting ways to distract and suppress and repress and so partly the i think the dark night um forces one into rooms that would be very difficult to get into otherwise except for maybe some of the crises that happen to people where they're they're pinned or you know they lose the work they do they lose the love they had they lose their house they and they're just faced with you know they they get a one way do not pass go do not collect $200 trip to the dark regions of their psyche you know reminds me of the lord of the rings the, the closer frodo got to the mountain the harder what it was for him to proceed you know yes and he couldn't even have done the final thing of throwing the ring in unless Gollum had bit his finger off and, and jumped, you know, fallen in himself with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah you know, he, he couldn't have taken that step. Well, and this is what St. John says, we do everything that we can do and then the Holy takes over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess, you know, one of the sentiments behind most, a lot of my questions and behind the, the very existence of this show is the feeling that um, some sort of mass awakening is taking place and that um, you know many of the things that people who've been on a spiritual path for for some time have experienced are becoming or will become epidemic and that um, it, it will be really valuable for us as a spiritual culture we were talking earlier about that sort of network um, to have tools available that are as evolved and, and effective as possible to um, offer on a wider scale as as they are needed um, yeah do you have a sense yeah. of that well first i just want to say i have a sense of your heart and i just want to acknowledge that thank you yeah it's like it's touching here uh the heart underneath what you're saying um certainly even if we cast aside all spiritual orientation and we just look at the earth and the dwindling resources and the um the way that as resources dwindle more and more of us are faced with in a way um as resources dwindle our capacity for distracting ourselves from our essential pain dwindles so we can all be groovy when we have plenty of food and you know our hot tub and our, our friends and we feel pretty good and then put us in a boat with 12 others of us with no water and no food and see how quickly we turn into ferrets yeah and nothing against ferrets and ferrets are relatively um, friendly compared to what yeah, we yeah. might turn into yeah <laughs> badger <laughs> maybe cornered wolverines cornered or something yeah corner yeah. badgers yeah <laughs> wolverines yeah um and this part of us stays pretty hidden in western culture uh -huh. um in certain layers of western culture but as we um pressure we can feel very uh spiritually um above it all when we look at other people who are maybe battling with more basic things than we are sure. um, but the 
like this the is, opioid epidemic, for instance. Right, and th this is a. Uh, um, so basically, whether or not we have a spiritual perspective, as resources dwindle, we will need more capacities to meet the rising discomfort in us that tends to act itself out on ourselves and others. And that's our model in our culture. It's sort of whose fault it is, let's punish them. Mm. And there's not a sense of owning and transmuting the energies of transformation um, so that uh, the animal aspect of us um, actually gets dealt with in a way that turns it into the ox in the final ox herder picture where the little Buddha is just riding in without a rein on this tremendous ox um, because we have um, brought consciousness um, and kindness to the corners of our being that are unconsciously animal-like and um, so I totally um, agree that that we need tools and I call it technology it's like we are missing um, as a culture a, a widespread orientation toward a technology of dismantling the bomb b-o-m-b -B, the bomb of um, sort of the ticking angry hurt creature um, and uh, I, f I feel like I have some of that technology and I feel that this uh, Dark Knight book, it's a survival guide that I'm working mm. on, will hand that technology. I know I have one student um, who is a longtime Buddhist who uh, said she can't wait till my book comes out because she's going to hand it to every Buddhist teacher she knows because right. a lot of people are entering the dark and a lot of teachers haven't, either they haven't had that experience or they don't know what to do with those people. and. Um, and there's a lot there's a lot of pieces to it mm. maybe we can do another interview when your book comes out um and somebody should write a book like that on kundalini too because these people that i hear from uh they're out there nobody knows what they're going through and if they see a doctor the doctor's just going to give them psycho yeah. psychotropic drugs or whatever they're called you know which they totally grate against the the nervous system in terms of what they actually need so there really needs to be um and there are some people you know, like um, yeah, Joan know. Shiva, Pita Harrigan, and Bonnie Greenwell, and others who specialize in Kundalini situations. But there, there almost needs to be like a clinic where that people could go to when they're really in a state of emergency. We uh, we, we need a number of clinics. Yeah, I'm constantly a, all over. I, I'm constantly in desire for these people. You know, uh, we all, when we go into the dark night, we like we long for some quiet place by the ocean where we're sitting in our little wheelchair with our little flannel lap blanket, and someone's <laughs> just bringing us mush, and we're just staring out at the, you know, someone's handling everything because yeah. to to be a, a caterpillar who's liquefying without a cocoon is tremendously, yeah. tremendously painful. And and unfortunately, um, I think a lot of these people end up in psychiatric hospitals. Some do, and some, you know, yeah, I yeah. mean. And it doesn't take, you know, people don't actually have to leave their lives. Um, this is the beauty of the wisdom of healthy yang is that um, healthy containment, a cocoon, an egg, a nest, uh, a belly with a baby in it, that healthy containment allows transformation to happen inside it. And when people start to learn the lessons of containment within their lives, they can start to set up structures within which some of that transformation can happen. Um, but when you don't know the lessons of yang or yin, the, the transformational energy inside the structure and the structures that allow it, um, then you're just out there getting buffeted without, you know, like a poor little caterpillar liquefying as you're trying to build your cocoon and the, the world is taking it apart. You know? Yeah. Um, let's take a brief break from Dark Knight. Here's a question. Yes. <laughs> question from Marie in Boulder, uh, not too far from where you are. Uh, Marie asks, you mentioned that you support people in reconnecting with the innocence of a child. So what would you say is the difference, if there is one, between the innocence of a child and the spontaneous wisdom of a sage? Wow, what a great question. Not much. <laughs> I can tell you one thing, you know, Ken, Ken Wilber talks about the pre-trans fallacy. Yeah, you know, yeah. You've heard of that. And, um, yeah, I'm not super, super educated, and, and I, I would say, you know, 
I, I got to do this research up close, you know, because my child, you know, came out when I was being deconstructed. And, um, you know, her childlike innocence um, lacked uh, the sort of um, know-how about things like traffic, mm. you know, so a mature sense of childlike innocence includes levels of sophistication and I'm not talking about conditioned things because I might have had some knowing as an adult that she would have blown out of the water by her open freshness that would have shown itself to be conditioned garbage. Mm. But there are certain things uh, that it, it helps to, um, you know, it, it's like if we all were children and then we just grew up, there's, a, there, there's something else that's almost like a, the way the Im the way that the human embodiment gets tested and transmuted um, in the process of maturing um, that, you know, also the innocence of a child often has a lot of uh, narcissism in it. There's not necessarily a, a sense of the, of the whole um, and of one's part in the whole. Um, yeah, the sense of, of being sort of grounded in having almost like had an egoic structure and then moving through that 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 has sort of a deeper wiser a deep wine taste to the innocence mm. an awareness of you know of death of suffering that a child might not have on the other hand you know walking up to dead things when my child was little you know we we'd walk up to a dead bird and i would keep my conditioning as best as i could off of her i wouldn't say anything and i would let her curiosity lead and um, to see that she had, she didn't have a fear of death. She didn't have an idea about dead being bad. It was just sort of another curious thing. And, and um, in fact, uh, one of the things she said when she was young was, oh, there's lots of adventures ahead, like death. <laughs> wow, she said that, huh? <laughs> she, did, she said a lot of cool stuff, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's more of a question I wouldn't mind just planting in me as a percolating seed because I think it's a it's a great it's a great question yeah. but I also I don't you know Sophia also said something very interesting she said that uh, the, the way you can tell an adult is not by how big they are she said because there are some very big people who are children mm -hmm. she said the way you tell them as adult is by how serious they are mm -hmm. and she was talking about this grim thing that yeah. settles on us in our conditioning so we, we take everything grimly and so what I've noticed in being sort of, uh, in a way, there's an aspect of divine child um, about my embodiment um, is that the goofiness and the silliness and the innocence that we feel like we are supposed to outgrow is actually such a wellspring of healing for other beings. And um, I feel like humor and playfulness is really at the at the heart of um of embodying this uh, this mysterious i don't even know what to say there i don't even have a word well one thing that came to mind as you were speaking was that um you know there are all these not only does our body grow as we move from infancy through childhood to adulthood but there are all these different faculties that, that grow in, and that you know that can be developed to a profound degree. Intellect is one. Heart is another. And yeah. um, and if as long as those things aren't aren't um, kind of developed in a lopsided way in which they're thought to be sort of the the be all and end all, as long as they're kind of understood and experienced as components of the complete system, and everything is in balance. Uh, there's a huge difference between a young baby or child and you know a fully blossomed adult, blossomed in the in the spiritual sense. Absol you know, so absolutely. Someone like Shankara, who had this incredible intellect and incredible heart and incredible depth of being. Um, so you know, and someone like that, and we've we've all been around you know saintly types, I'm sure, and seen their innocence mm -hmm. and their child likeness. But they're not simpletons. They're not sim. You know, they're not simplistic. Well, it, Go ahead. Yes, I was just going to say. I almost wanted to say, and neither neither are children. Although everything that you just said is absolutely accurate, yeah. and part of to me the joy of being an adult human being, 
who is open is that there are so many uh, colors in our palette to paint with and part of what I uh, part of what I teach and hold space for is the exploration of yin and the exploration of yang, the energies in us of fierceness, of taking a stand, because the heart is not all just mush. It's also passionate, uh, a passionate sort of standing in the truth kind of thing. And boy, is there such a joy and a capacity to be a servant of the truth when your whole palate is um, firing. Mm. To mix a metaphor there. Yeah. I've got engines and paint boxes now together. Uh, we're, we're throwing around <laughs> a lot of metaphors today. <laughs> um, well, the, I discovered a week ago that um, YouTube automatically will transcribe any um, interview under two hours. So this is an incentive wow. for me to keep them under two hours. They, and it's quite accurate, actually. <laughs> Uh, wow. And we want, we hope to use those transcripts to make this available in, in a number of other languages because Google uses artificial intelligence to translate into uh, about 10 different languages. And this is a good plug for my translation and transcription team. If anyone would like to join it, get in touch. There's a page on the website about it. But I'm saying that as a sort of a prelude to, you know. S yeah, we need to stop. <laughs> yeah, but not immediately. I, and there's okay. there's one thing that maybe we could talk. I, I started out this interview reading you a question from somebody who, who's asking about the holy. And maybe we could just talk a little bit about God in, in the remaining minutes. Not in the sort of conventional religious sense, but you know what we, what in the sense that you and I would appreciate and most of the people listening to this. And okay. you, you want a question? Um, uh, I, yeah, I mean, you know, well, for instance, yeah, from quoting okay. from your book, um, you know, here I'm quoting something, thy will, not mine. All I want is truth or make me an instrument of your peace. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, so I, I can say something. Yeah, that. go ahead. Here's another true phrase to prime your pump. Um, reliance on a sense of separated personhood to a joyful reliance on God. Yeah. Something you said. Yeah. So first off, man, is it hard to talk? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I feel like, you know, I used to um, sit in a, a sweat lodge quite a bit with a friend of mine and I noticed that the prayers that were the most beautiful were not the prayers where people were trying to be beautiful. They were the prayers where people knew they couldn't speak. It was unspeakable and yet they tried anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I want to say that I am always in that mode of being deeply aware that what I know in my direct experience can never be spoken and yet it feels like a worship to attempt it, a beauty, a sacrament to attempt it. Um, and I also feel a, a deep level of, of integrity and care um, in answering things as unconceptually and born of the deep wisdom, energy, aliveness of the moment that, that the things that I say are given to say instead of things that my mind would say that are a degree removed from actuality, you know, and, and so the holy that's the word that i use because i feel like it it sneaks in the side door a lot of people have a lot of conditioning around god the word god and and i i take that on with people and encourage them to look into that and you know anywhere that we're i can't go there because i have stuff is like you know let's go there <laughs> you know like let's go there let's see what lives there um so as long as we are identified as a me, well, this is really difficult to speak. Um, there is, and in fact, there's a Sufi story about a, a fellow who uh, experienced enlightenment and then uh, grieved because he so loved the language of duality. He so loved the love language of praising God. Mm. Um, and I can remember lying in bed with my little daughter and uh, singing to her. I used to sing her 15 songs every night, 15 songs. Mm. Um, just, and this voice, I'd be lying there in the dark and this voice would come out of the darkness and sing. And I would watch it sing. And there was this 
and and we would say I love you I love you and when I would say I love you I knew to a degree that that the how do I say this the I love you was the way that the divine danced here but that it wasn't wholly true because there was a oneness and yet there was this beautiful way that the holy dances in duality I love you uh, the beautiful way that um, it it you know, it, it's like this is, as far as I can tell, this is what we're doing here. We, this beautiful dance of um, high, high, you know, and then in the high, high, like sometimes I do uh, diet exercises in my work, and there's there's a the people experience as they speak at the beginning, high, 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 and then pretty soon there's just this this oneness. How can we even speak? And yet the high. The high can actually speak the oneness. It, it can also speak in duality. And so uh, there's a sense uh, for me of a, of a simultaneity of instrument and, you know, it's, it's so, um, it's like a, almost like a membrane, an invisible membrane or, a, you know, the pitcher underwater. You know, it's like, it's a pitcher, but it's made of gossamer. You know, there's just this little sense of a, of a geniusness, of a geniness, and this amazing, worshipful, blissful, joyful yesness about, you know, in that, you know, where'd the genie go? And yet, you know, this is the language, like, and when we, when separation is more what we're living from um there can be a beautiful way that the heart can rise in a praising in a a help you know i don't know how help that more than uh glorifies something outside opens something inside you know to a kind of an openness outside of this sort of little shell that we live in um, so uh, this question, I, I almost just want to answer with like poem after poem after poem and, and, and no logic at all. You know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. it's, it's mysterious how, um, how form and formless, form and formless are dancing all the time. And it's not that we're here to do away with the form as much as be, it's like a plaything. Yeah. Shankara said the intellect imagines, devo imagines duality for the sake of devotion. And he was the founder of Advaita, really, and um, you know, was also a great devotee of the Divine Mother. Um, and I, I can't actually think of a, a, a non-dual authority, uh, quote-unquote, such, you know, like Nisargadatta, Ramana, Papaji, all of them were, had tremendous hearts and were great devotees oh. and lovers yeah. of God and did all sorts of practices and of worship and pujas love, and bhajans of, and all that stuff. <laughs> I mean, and Ramana with his mountain. Yeah, you know? really. Yeah. It's like when people reduce spiritual truths to things like, I should be able to be open anywhere. So even though I have this deep longing to go to Tahiti, I'm going to stay here. And, you know, it's like that's uh, Ramana went to the mountain. He stayed to, stayed at the mountain. Mm -hmm. The mountain was his place, you know. Yeah. I think the reason it's worth mentioning is that there's a sweetness to that, to the blossoming of the heart and to the whole quality of devotion that it's nice to know that that's part of spiritual development because otherwise it can sometimes take on a kind of dry well, ca character in, in, in some ways that it's presented. And again, in our culture and threaded through our approach to spirituality is a worship of yang over the life-giving aspect of yin, both of them being the two dancing energies as life energy comes into this plane. And we will tend in our culture until examined or kidnapped by experience um, to bow to the the father energies over the mother energies and to see things like a tender heart. You know, a tender heart is such an aspect of awakening, a, a sensitive tenderness, such an aspect. But but we we like to glorify the all knowing and the you know the powerful and the truth and that's all. You know, heart without truth is just a sappy bog. But truth without heart and you know how. 
it's it's I don't even know if that exists. It doesn't exist. Yeah, at least not in its entirety or its totality. Right. It's it's half baked. Right. Half-baked. <laughs> <laughs> and we all know what getting a half-baked potato is like. I know. It's yeah. crunchy. You can't even <laughs> eat it. It might melt butter, but you can't eat it. So how are we doing on our time? I think we better wrap it up um, bef okay. before we go over past the witching hour. Yes. Uh, it's, it's cool <laughs> that Google does this now, YouTube. So um, it's been really great, Janie. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Um, Me too. Thank you so yeah. much. And I enjoyed preparing for this. and. I hope you know a lot of people get in touch with you. Um, Geniezandy.com is your website, right? It is. And it does this cool little thing. I, I have to find out how you do that. But there's a thing where you scroll down, and all of a sudden, the big Genie Zandy kind of gets small, and the menu moves over. And it's really neat the way that's that works. <laughs> <laughs> I'm blissfully ignorant of the technology behind yeah, that, despite some, having been in the software industry for 20 years. <laughs> some JavaScript thing or something. But yeah. anyway, there's a lot of good stuff on the website, and um, some very nice articles that people might like to read. I enjoyed reading them. And um, when do you think your book will be finished? I have no idea. Yeah, books, it's just, books it, have a way. I, I have they an don't outline. have a predictable gestation it, it period wants, like babies. It, it wants, it, it, it's wanted to be written since 2002 because mm. every single day since 2002, someone has needed this book from yeah. me. And um, I can't wait to have it and be able to hand it to people. And it's, you know, have a very, very busy schedule. So I work on it when yeah. I can. And I hear I may have a little bit of, of help assembling the information. We'll see if that pans out. And that, okay. that will be a big, big help. Well, I'm sure it'll be good. So good luck with that. Thank um, you. All righty. So um, do you do any kind of one-on-one -on -one Skype things? Or you mainly just do groups here and there? Yeah, I don't do one-on-ones except to... So I... Um, I do online stuff. I do retreats. I speak here and there. I don't do any one-on-one -on -one stuff except for with pretty senior students who are um, in leadership sorts of positions. Mm -hmm. um, and although there's a, you know, in my online things, people have a good amount of access to me. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. Okay. And uh, I have a couple of retreats in the summer coming up in Santa Cruz and Brighton Bush Hot Springs, which is a favorite. Good. And, uh, yeah, if people want to get a little flavor of me, uh, Open Circle will have me, um, opencirclecenter.org mm -hmm. will have me on June 11th in the morning, 10 a.m. Pacific time. If people want to get a, a flavor of my more space holding aspect rather than my interview aspect. <laughs> okay, and that's, we're talking 2017 for those who may be watching later, but if they go to your website, geniezandy.com, they can find out what, whatever you're up to whenever they watch this. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So let me make a couple of general wrap-up points. I've been speaking with Jeannie Zandi. This is an ongoing series of interviews. Uh, if you've enjoyed it and want to check out others, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and explore the menus. Um, you can also, there's an upcoming interviews menu where you can see what's scheduled going, you know, in the future. Um, and as I said in the beginning, this whole thing kind of depends upon support from people who appreciate it. So if you feel like contributing in some way, uh, there's a PayPal button on the site, <clears throat> and uh, you can sign up to be notified by email of new interviews when they're released. You can also, um, you know, sign up for the audio podcast on iTunes or Stitcher, or one of those platforms. Um, also, if you happen to be watching this on uh, YouTube, I would appreciate it if you actually subscribe to the channel because the more subscribers you have on a YouTube channel, the more YouTube kind of like pays attention to you and you can talk to people on the phone and they help you with things. And also, I'd like to sort of, mm -hmm. I'm only at about 28,000 subscribers, but if I reach the 100,000 mark, it's like becoming an Eagle Scout or something in terms of <laughs> your status with YouTube. So, something to strive for. <laughs> yeah. So, thanks, Jeannie. I've really appreciated it. And thanks to those who've been listening or watching. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, people. <laughs>